Thanks very much, Mark Davy. Great to see everyone. The last uh, talk in our Dharma parlour of this festival. It's true, the talk is entitled uh, The Buddha Broke My Heart. Now, when uh, Lokabandhu gave the first talk of this Dharma parlour um, uh, season uh, back on uh, Thursday, seems like ages ago, he made the admission that his, his talk title, which was tremendously high sounding and interesting, had been thought up months ago and what he was going to talk about wasn't anything like that. And uh, I have to admit that uh, it was a moment of inspiration when I thought of this talk title last April, The Buddha Broke My Heart. But uh, as I've uh, thought about it a bit more, it does turn out to be a little bit untrue that in fact the Buddha broke my heart. Perhaps I should retitle it, The Buddha Broke My Heart As It Were. <laughs> or so to speak. I don't know if anybody would like to leave now having heard that or whether you're willing to give it a go. So uh, great, <laughs> I'll keep going. We have to uh, submit titles for these talks months in advance and of course some of us who are busy thinking about other things don't actually work out the details until like uh, Friday morning. So uh, this, is the, this is the problem. So it was a rhetorical, a piece of shameless rhetoric, the idea that the Buddha broke my heart. And yet, and yet, I want to talk about a process which is not actually unconnected. No, thanks very much. I got them from my mum and dad, but I'll find some other chairs. Thanks very much, Aramati. That was nice. Um, it's not actually disconnected from what I want to talk about, which is the role of the experience of disillusionment, as it were, and broken-heartedness as an experience in the, uh, in the Buddhist spiritual life, well, specifically in the life devoted to cultivating love or metta. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And this came from my response to um, the title of this festival. I saw that the festival was entitled Fire in the Heart. And it was all about the, the uh, Buddhist teachings on, on uh, metta and love, unconditional love for all living beings. Uh, tremendously idealistic uh, teachings on the possibility of transforming the heart, uh, which of course are not just limited to Buddhism. All religions worth the name uh, teach the transformation of the base material of uh, our emotions into the gold of, of love for beings. What could be higher as an ideal than uh, the ability to uh, hold in our hearts, be positive towards living beings. And fire signifies the passion, the longing, the yearning that we might have for this kind of uh, idealism, for this, uh, for this love. It's a very idealistic vision. And I think the Buddha taught uh, uh, the idea of metta, the ideal of metta, in a very idealistic, uplifting way. So, for instance, he described somebody who was a, a, a follower of, of his teaching uh, as follows. He said, someone who is a follower of the Buddhas, who is without covetousness, ill will or confusion, mindful and aware, lives pervading the first direction with an attitude of metta or love. Then the second, the third and the fourth, this means in front, behind, left and right, you might as well add up and down. One lives totally pervading the world, the whole world, above, below, around, everywhere, with an extravagant, magnificent, boundless attitude of metta, without hostility and without ill will. So this is how the Buddha taught uh, 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 the importance of metta or love in in the Buddhist life. In a, in a very famous poem called the Metta Sutta, um, there are some lines which also evoke this high ideal. Just as a mother would protect her own child, her only child, guarding it with her life, so should one cultivate a boundless heart of loving kindness or metta towards all beings, and metta towards the whole world. So should one cultivate a boundless heart, above, below, all around, unhindered, without hatred and without hostility. 
So we see these beautiful high ideals right from the beginning of the Buddhist tradition aimed at anybody who's interested in following the Buddha's teachings. Pervading the world with an attitude of love. Cultivating love like the intense love a mother feels for her only child. And uh, when we hear about these, these ideals, for some of us at least, we get fired up by them. We think, yes, this is the kind of thing I, I would like to practice. I'd like to, um, I'd like to be the case. I'd like to transform my heart in accordance with these ideals. And then it's, it's at that moment we give our hearts to these ideals. We might give our hearts to, uh, to uh, the Buddha's teaching on love. We might take up uh, um, the practice of metta bhavana, the cultivation of loving kindness. Uh, we might, in fact, try and practice it in our lives. We might uh, try and transform or work on our tendencies to grumpiness or ill will or anger. Uh, we, might, uh, we might decide to get in touch with someone we've fallen out with and make up with them and so on. So we might place our trust, we might place our trust in these teachings. We might place our heart in the possibility of this kind of transformation this possibility of love. Uh, and this in a way is part of the meaning of trust or faith in the Buddha, placing the heart in the teachings. We uh, put our hopes on them in a way. We, we hope that life is going to uh, perhaps be a bit better than what we know of it. And these ideals give us, give us a way to, uh, to structure that hope, to make it possible for us to feel that life will be uh, as, as a rich and positive experience as we might have wanted it to be. It's at just this point, I want to uh, say, of placing our heart on these high ideals, uh, that we might find ourselves experiencing heartbreak. Heartbreak, and here's where the, uh, the uh, broken-heartedness theme comes in uh, to my talk. Because, of course, um, when we put our trust in someone, when we give our heart, uh, this doesn't always work out. So uh, there's a similarity, I think, in practicing metta bhavana, in being inspired by these teachings. There's a similarity to the experience of falling in love. I'm not quite sure how much we can push this comparison. This is where my, I've got a bit of hesitation, but you know, you can, uh, you can work out for yourselves whether you can sense any similarity. My sense of what I mean is that when we fall in love, when we fall in love with, uh, with someone, uh, they, as it were, stand out for us as someone wonderful at last whom we've met who meets a, a lack or a need, perhaps that we didn't even recognise. Perhaps we didn't even quite know that we missed just this person in our lives. And it's this that uh, uh, creates the, the effect of us giving our hearts. We put our hopes in, in this person. If this person was uh, in my life, things would be fine, things would be good. I mean, obviously it's different for all of us, isn't it, this experience, but I'm trying to evoke an underlying kind of uh, pattern. And um, I suppose it's not unusual that uh, the process of falling in love ends in heartbreak. Uh, things don't quite work out as uh, we might have liked. So. Um, I suppose I'd be quite interested to know if uh, any of you by any chance have had your hearts broken. Would anybody like to lift their arms? Oh, <laughs> that's great. That's more or less everybody, isn't it? I was, uh, that's what I was suspecting, but I wasn't quite sure. So uh, it's certainly something that I'm familiar with. One puts one's trust in, in, in a relationship and it doesn't work out. This was a long time ago, but it's still an important uh, part of my experience. And the reason is very important, I think. I'm going to um, mention the psychologist James Hillman. 
now. James Hillman is uh, an important figure in archetypal psychology. He's a very naughty psychologist. He tends to um, make points that go right against our usual ways of thinking. And uh, his teaching on betrayal is one of those. He says that um, a really important part of growing up psychologically, a really important part of developing mature, true maturity of the soul, of the psyche, is betrayal being betrayed and uh, I think falling in love and having your heart broken is just this kind of process isn't it uh, falling in love in a way invites our naive trust in the universe we found them at last fantastic the universe is uh, is as wonderful as I hoped it is and we put our trust in that person and what happens they fall in love with somebody else they uh, decide to change their gender or <laughs> become a Buddhist or, 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 and give up sex, you know, or, or whatever it is, you know, everything goes wrong. And on the one hand, you can think, yeah, I could have seen that. On the other hand, it's too late. You had given your heart with the naivety of someone who doesn't really understand everything and your heart broken. You've been betrayed. You've been betrayed by that person. You've been betrayed by the universe, you could say. The universe is not as lovely as you thought it must be for this to happen. And this is, can be a bit baffling, can't it? You can think, why, why, why is it quite like this? And, um, um, but this process of betrayal, according to James Hillman, is the route to maturity. Without this kind of betrayal, how can we develop true maturity, which is when we see through our naivety and uh, we see what the universe is actually like. It's, there's love and there's non-love. Uh, things might go according to how we'd like it and also they won't. Uh, things will go as they go, actually, and uh, our place in the universe is not guaranteed to be a happy one. Uh, all we can do is do our best. Uh, and gain enough wisdom to, as it were, uh, not put our own foots in it too much, as it were. And uh, that's uh, one version of psychological maturity, you could say. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this process. Um, I got my heart broken really badly when I was about 23. It's uh, it's a kind of double heartbreak. I, I, I split up with one girlfriend because I fell in love with another one. Uh, but this other one... <laughs> so it's all in the past. <laughs> uh, but this other one was not in a terribly organised state. And she was already in love with somebody else. But was trying not to be with that person, but thought I'd be a better bet. But you know how it goes. The other somebody else made her an offer she couldn't refuse and off she went, you know, off she went, leaving me completely bereft. I didn't know what had happened. Um, and then I realised, you know, that I'd left the first one, <laughs> who now thought I was an absolute, you know, um, git. And uh, so that really, she didn't want me back. Um, <laughs> fair enough really, isn't it? So uh, uh, that was, uh, that's how it went. And it led to, you know, you know, I felt a bit miserable. I'm sure you can relate to that kind of thing. It's amazing how personally we take it. I think that's what's interesting, isn't it? Because we take our, our own experience very personally. Uh, but my goodness, was that an important experience for me. I think without that, uh, I would uh, not have got through to um, knowing what, how, what relationships uh, actually involve, I think. Having the ability to um, to uh, negotiate um, the, 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 the realities of love and intimacy. There you go. So that's just my experience. So how does all this fit with Buddhism? Well, my idea is that um, maybe some very similar process does go on in our relationship with the ideals which we take up. Uh, when we get interested in the Buddhist spiritual life, or perhaps any really sincere, heartfelt commitment to a spiritual ideal. Perhaps betrayal, this is where I'm, I was, I'm backtracking on the idea of the Buddha broke my heart, perhaps betrayal's the wrong word. 
and perhaps what I'd like to talk about more literally would be disillusionment. Disillusionment with uh, the possibility of these ideals really being true. Uh, we might get really fired up with the idea of unbounded loving kindness towards all beings. We take on board this idea, we try and practice with it, we do our best, but at a certain point the reality of how things are, the difficulties of not just um, sorting things out a long way away, but even in our own relationships becomes really obvious. We can't even sort out our own family relationships perhaps. And you think, what was I doing believing it was possible? A kind of disillusionment can, uh, can set in. But um, I think a very similar process uh, can, can go on here and the reason I want to talk about this is uh, to give you some ideas uh, in case some kind of disillusionment uh, occurs to you. Perhaps you've been tremendously fired up by something on this festival, something's really touched you, so you've really learned something and have got some ideas to take back into your lives. Now what happens when these ideals hit the realities, the rocks of what actually is? Uh, here's a line of thought to, um, to take on board. I'd say that um, idealism is absolutely crucial for, for getting us going in the spiritual life. If we didn't believe it was possible to become awakened pretty soon, because, I've, because surely it's not that difficult. <laughs> if you didn't have that sense, perhaps would we start? Would we even start? Would we plunge in? Maybe that's like a very youthful form of idealism. Maybe some of you are a bit, bit more mature than that. But still, if you didn't think the ideals were possible, would you bother? Our hearts get touched by spiritual ideals, so we give ourselves to them. But it's very important, this process of disillusionment after that stage, to uh, encounter not just the problems with our ideals, but the way, in fact, the other people who we think might teach us and help us, how they're just human. They're uh, just as bad as us, or even worse, on the whole. They appear not to have sorted themselves out at all. They appear unable to see their own problems. They appear, appear unable to even make up with people they're supposedly friends with. The whole Buddhist movement is a kind of mess and uh, obviously they're not going to get anywhere like that. So a certain sort of disillusionment is pretty much, uh, um, pretty much part of the course, I think. I had a very strong sense of disillusionment with the Tree Ratna tradition in the late 90s when a book came out explaining how women were, had much less spiritual aptitude than men. Terrible book. Uh, about uh, this completely anti-feminist kind of take on things and I couldn't, it just completely clashed with my own values uh, but it turned out a few years later I think a lot of us went through this kind of disillusionment and came out and just decided we don't agree with that I don't know anybody who agrees with it anymore actually so, uh, but I think that kind of disillusionment is very important for forming spiritual maturity if you can get through the difficulties you learn who you are you learn who you are in your own, in your own uh, belly, as it were. You find a kind of bedrock on which to uh, live from your own ideals, but in a, in a new way. Uh, so this is a very important kind of process, I think. Uh, idealism, disillusionment, spiritual maturity. And, um, yeah, so I suppose to summarise, we need teachings about disillusionment. I've written, because people will always let you down. But uh, that's a kind of disillusioning thing to say, isn't it? But, uh, so is it true? Will people always let you down? I suppose they'll all die, won't they? <laughs> but uh, maybe not everybody will let you down. We just don't know, do we? But uh, you don't really know when we start off uh, practicing um, in a tradition quite how it will go, go on and I think more or less when we see what people are really like they don't quite live up to our expectations perhaps that's the, the main thing and I thought I'd talk about this in a bit more detail in relation to the five stages of metta bhavana practice so for those of you unfamiliar with the metta bhavana the cultivation of love 
which we uh, teach and practice in our tree ratna tradition. I'll just summarise it. We practice, we practice the cultivation of love in five stages as a way to, to develop uh, thorough loving kindness. In the first stage, we practice metta towards ourselves. We get into a, a sense of inner appreciation towards ourselves. In the second stage, we bring in a good friend, somebody who we're very fond of, we have a clear, positive relationship with, and really bring to mind, bring into our hearts and imaginations our sense of uh, love for them. Building on that, we bring in a neutral person, someone that we don't know, that they're just a face, we know that they're a human being, but we don't know them otherwise, the postman or uh, a shopkeeper or something. And we similarly think, we, we, we bring them to mind to think, well, just like me, they want to be happy. May they be happy, just as a fellow human being. Then, in the fourth stage, we bring to mind a difficult person, somebody who we don't get on with, um, somebody who might be an enemy. And with that person, uh, we similarly try to cultivate uh, positivity. I mean, to what degree is it possible? The best thing is, th uh, uh, is to actually just relate to them as a fellow human being. Just like me, they want to be happy, so we don't get on but um, you drop the ill will. And then in the fifth stage of this practice, we spread, that, spread out this love imaginatively to all beings. And that's the, in a way, the end, the culmination of the whole practice. So some of you will be familiar with this, others perhaps not. So I thought I'd talk about disillusionment in relation to each of these stages. So firstly, when we're practicing metta towards ourselves, uh, we're just learning to appreciate our own experience, learning to give conscious appreciation to our positive qualities and perhaps uh, just relax with what else might be going on and bring in an attitude of love, even if uh, it's not so easy. And yet, um, if we do this for long enough, our minds start to become quite integrated and uh, more generally positive, especially if this is part of an overall um, practice of, uh, of Buddhism combined with other, other forms of meditation. Our minds start to become integrated and happier. At this very point, at this very point in which we start to experience a bit more happiness and settledness, what comes along but what was repressed? So psychologi psychological sort of teaching again, but uh, that which at some point or other was repressed and put away in the dark cupboards of our minds, it comes out because it feels welcomed by our nice shiny mind, as it were. And uh, this is just what happens, I think, in the spiritual life. Uh, we wouldn't want it to happen, we'd like to experience just more happiness and uh, integration. But uh, unfortunately, that which we didn't know about ourselves comes knocking on the door. And this can have the effect of uh, really throwing us. I've got a friend who, um, when he was younger, he really gave himself to the Jehovah's Witnesses, which as you can imagine, are, um, is a religious organisation which demands a kind of belief. And he uh, managed to engage in it in such a way that he completely believed that he just had to completely believe in it and if you ever doubt anything, God will hate you and send you to hell. Because that's kind of part of their teaching. Um, and he deeply internalised this and he's become a Buddhist, he's practised for years and years, but a few years ago, having practised for quite a while, this voice in him, this childish voice that said, if you don't believe in God, you're going to hell, just arose. And it really threw him, it's really thrown him, it made him very miserable and he didn't know what on earth to do. Now at this point, what actually do you do? I think one option is just to give up all this meditation and stuff, which clearly is having such an effect. On the other hand, this kind of disillusionment with the process can lead to a kind of maturity. You start to handle your own uh, inner process in new ways. You might uh, turn to some psychotherapeutic help, you might talk with your friends, you might start to take on board that this is a big project we've taken on to really transform the heart. This is a big project and it's going to take a while. And that work is really worthwhile. It really is worthwhile because if you can work through it, you've really got something to give. Does that make sense? 
If you've worked through your own stuff, my goodness, other people will appreciate it because you'll be able to manifest a kind of spiritual maturity just by being yourself. I think this is an important principle. Um, and the end result of moving through this kind of disillusionment about what it is to practice is you become very open to your own, to your own uh, process, as it were. You, 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 you know how to look after yourself. You know how to protect yourself when you need to as it were, from experiences which you probably can't deal with too well. But you know exactly where your strengths are as well. So this kind of disillusionment, it might feel, do you see what I mean, it's not quite like being broken hearted, <laughs> but it might feel very difficult in, a, in just the same kind of way when you're up against life really not being as you thought it would be. So in the second stage of the Metta Bhavana, we we uh, cultivate love towards our good friend. Now really, for most of us, this is pretty much the easiest stage, I think. As long as we've got a good friend, we can bring them to mind and we can uh, remember our positivity, our feelings of goodwill and love towards them. And uh, actually it's beautiful to do this, to, you know, to take it, to, to take into your mind the, 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 the different friends you've got and to bear in mind the different qualities, different good qualities they have and how much you appreciate them. Uh, but for some of us who have, as it were, very good friends, best friends as it were, an experience can arise uh, which is that they let you down. Yeah. And uh, this is a bit different to uh, when you have your heart broken by someone you've fallen in love with. In a way it's even worse because friendship is such a sort of uh, uh, adult, already a mature sort of relationship. Uh, and they don't necessarily mean to let you down, that it's not personal at all. Um, so my example is that um, I, I, I really, I've, all, I've often had like a very close male friend in my life. It's just been part of my experience. I really seem to appreciate and need that kind of uh, intimacy. And a few years ago, I had this very close friend in Cambridge. And um, he uh, fell in love with this uh, nice lady. He was always keen on nice ladies. But uh, <laughs> she was visiting from Australia. Visiting from Australia. So he decided to move to Australia. Uh, for this woman <laughs> and uh, he did so actually and it didn't even last and he stayed there and it turned out that he really wanted to move yeah he really wanted to move from Cambridge but he hadn't quite told me that and I, I felt very it was very difficult because um, it was very difficult because I just didn't understand why he was moving away and what on earth that meant as it were apart from he prefers these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, chasings after women to real friendship. <laughs> you, you end up sort of feeling like, well, it's just not worth getting too close to, uh, to other guys, you know, because they're going to go, go off. And then a, few, a couple of years ago, I, 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 I've got another uh, very close friend in Cambridge and actually we got to manage to live together to share a house and he's, he's a very sort of rambunctious person what does rambunctious mean yeah he's effervescent full of beans bit like Joseph but not quite uh, and but and it took a while to learn to live with him because he's rambunctious but I soon found it really delightful once I went with the energy but um, he'd met a woman and uh, he decided to move down and, and marry her in, in London. And then, of course, he's, um, he's there in, in living. It's not so far away, it's not Australia. But still, it's like, ah, oh, here we go. But actually, as I prepared for this talk, I remembered I had this best friend at school, very close best friend, and um, Andy. And um, I saw him uh, just... Um, few months back he lives up in Edinburgh and it's been very hard to stay in touch with him he won't like contact me so I've made an effort to get in touch with him and in conversation with him it soon became apparent that his experience of me when I when we were 18 was that I really betrayed him 
and uh, I hadn't quite realised. Just like these other friends are talking about, I can be just like that. I got more interested in girlfriends than in him and he was com really hurt and betrayed. Experienced betrayal, let's say. So I have to admit that, well, it's not, you know, I, I could be just the same as this. So, um, in a way, the more you love your friends, the more it's possible for them to let you down, even, that, even when they don't really, they don't even intend to at all. And the reason is, I think, because our friendships are invested with our, our affections, with our, um, with our desire to find people who occupy a certain sort of place in our life, who will give us the support we want. We get into a sort of reciprocal agreement, I suppose, at a certain level, that we'll, uh, we'll look to each other. And of course, when your friends uh, uh, do their own thing, when they uh, let you down, you're up against the fact that you're not getting what you want. Your attachments and your affections, as it were, cause suffering, just like the Buddha said. Uh, that's a, a reference to the way there are some lots of teachings of the Buddha, which uh, he kind of uh, he, he's, he's very keen on spiritual friendship, but he warns that affection. Uh, and attachment tends to cause problems and I think this is partly what he's talking about um, that the more you love your close friends the more that they might let you down so a certain disillusionment with the whole process of sort of trying to make friends can crop up I don't know if, if you've it gets more obvious as you get older I think but this is a really important moment I think to step back and uh, consider how, um, how can we really love without holding on? How can we really love people who we uh, really value, uh, we appreciate, who we think are good people, who we, whose company we enjoy, without expecting them to always be there in just the right place in our lives? How can we appreciate them uh, and actually love them without holding on, allowing them to be just as they are and make whatever decisions they need to make? This is real spiritual maturity, isn't it? To be able to do that, to be able to hold that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, capacity for love. But actually it's very worth it, I think, because that kind of capacity for love is in fact true friendship. True friendship is the ability to recognise, to, to deeply know your friend, to recognise uh, what is the value of them, to be able to advise them in a really helpful way, to be really uh, true to the friendship and yet not to base your advice on what, you, what you're going to get out of it. I think it really hurts sometimes. So here's the disillusionment. A kind of broken heartedness can, can appear uh, which is about friendship itself I think. That it's, uh, it's not how it once appeared. So then, in the third stage of the metta bhavana, we uh, cultivate uh, loving kindness or metta towards the neutral person. Now, here's someone safe, you might think. Here's a here's someone safe, someone you don't know, a bus bus driver or, or shopkeeper. They're not going to let you down, are they? They're just neutral people. They don't you don't know them. So we can extend loving kindness towards them. And I'm going to share a bit of poetry with you. This is uh, I think this is. This is from Wordsworth, one of my favourite poets. And in this poem, it's from The Old Cumberland Beggar. It's a poem called The Old Cumberland Beggar. He evokes why it is, why it is that it's important to, um, to give to people we don't know. Why it is it's important to give to people we don't know. You might remember when the, there was a, a huge tsunami, yeah? I can't remember what year that was. Was it 2004? So many people died. Yeah, so many people died, and yet, in, in Britain at least, people gave, didn't they, about a billion pounds, I think, just voluntarily, to all these people they didn't know. And uh, what Wordsworth says is, um, Man is dear to man. The poorest poor long for some moments in a weary life when they can know and feel that they have been themselves the fathers and the dealers out of some small blessings. They have been kind to such as needed kindness for this single cause, 
for the single cause that we have all of us, one human heart. One human heart. I think he's really put his finger on something there, that uh, we, the neutral person allows us to feel this one human heart. We're all in this situation together. And uh, with that recognition, our, our, we, can, we can extend our, our feelings of love in quite practical ways to people we don't know. This is very idealistic, isn't it? This is beautiful. And, uh, but I want to say about this one that um, the other day I was in London. I was at a conference in London. Uh, it, was a, an, it was a Buddhist academics together conference. So it was a bunch of, of people who I thought, you know, mostly I knew them, so no problem. And, uh, but I had my computer stolen from my bag in the lecture theatre and my wallet and my phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the other week. Pain, eh? And, and I really doubt it's these Buddhist academics. It's going to be another student. It's going to be someone I didn't know, isn't it? So these very neutral people will steal from you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's going to be someone you don't know. It's going to steal your stuff because they're greedy, because they don't have wisdom. How long is that? Thank you, thank you, perfect. Um, so at this point we're going to become disillusioned, aren't we, with neutral people. And at this point you need a teaching from the Islamic tradition. Uh, as it says in the Quran, trust in Allah but tether your donkey anyway. Trust in Allah, but tether your donkey anyway. Isn't this important? This is important. You could become, if you open your heart to this one human heart we all share. I mean, here at the festival, it's very hard not to, isn't it? It's very hard not to see us all as uh, beautifully, uh, beautiful human beings together. Um, and yet, if you are naive, uh, you're going to get disillusioned by these neutral people, by these people with whom you share this human heart, because they will steal from you and exploit you and take advantage of your very idealism. Uh, so you need to know about this, and you need to bear it in mind, and look after your idealism in relation to realism, yeah? about what people are like. Uh, and uh, I think you know the worst case scenario is that you give up your idealism, just forget about the neutral people, which is very easy because they're neutral. Yeah, you just concentrate on the people you like. Uh, but here is where we need to to bring into mind bring to mind the Buddhist quality of equanimity. Equanimity. This is very important. It's a kind of development of metta or love. We cultivate an attitude to other people in which we're wise about how. What's happening for them is a product of what they've done and what they've been. And whatever they've done and been, they will, other people, they will um, uh, experience the results and fruits of that. And it's outside our hands. And that kind of brings a kind of wisdom into how we relate to neutral people. So uh, I'm going to go through the last two stages in a little bit, a little bit faster. We've got exactly 48 minutes uh, on the video recorder to get this whole thing in. So fourthly, the difficult person stage, we uh, bring to mind a difficult person, someone we're struggling with, uh, and we try to cultivate at least some positivity towards them. Now this is uh, not an easy thing to do at the best of times, so I'm not sure disillusionment is quite the way to talk about what can happen, but it's definitely becomes noticeable after a little while that often our difficult people are the very people we were formerly friends with. Yeah? They can switch stages, you know, in our, in our experience, in our meditations. And they usually do. So, they're usually our friends or our ex-friends. And um, there's, a, there's a very important proce process goes on practicing in the fourth stage of the Metta Bhavna, one in which we allow resolution and forgiveness to somehow sort of develop. This could be a very long business. You remember the, uh, the guy who didn't know 
what he was up to, who the girlfriend who broke my heart went off with in the end. I was really fed up with him because he had been, a, he, I trusted him, he was a good friend, and yet he totally let me down. And it took me 10 years to get to a sense of forgiveness. So I was on a retreat um, 10 years later, just practicing Metta Bhavana, and I had this sort of experience of, I put him in the fourth stage, and something dropped. Ping, and, I, and my heart let go. It let go of thinking that he was a, a kind of enemy or that he'd really let me down. I just let it go and thought, it's in the past, it's gone. I can let go. I forgive him, etc. And if I saw him again, it would be fine, I, I think. Because, you know, we were all just confused in a way. So that's the positive thing about this stage. Uh, in terms of disillusionment, or rather in terms of spiritual maturity, I'd really recommend learning a lesson from the Buddha here. So this stage is very difficult. Uh, you could become disillusioned and put off by your own failure in a way to make much progress. But what the Buddha did when things got, go, got tough, what the Buddha did when uh, things were difficult, can you guess? What he did was turn around and walked into the forest. He just headed off and spent some time in the forest on his own. He got away from things when they were tough. So he's really fed up with some monks one time. They were arguing amongst themselves about something small. And he said, monks, can I uh, help? And they said, no, <laughs> we're all right, we're happily arguing. Uh, he said, right, I'm off. And he went off to the forest. He, this was, you could imagine, this is frustrating for a, a man who likes to think he's awakened. He'd have thought, he'd probably think he could sort that one out. But, uh, nope. <laughs> So off he went to the forest and uh, he just spent some time on his own. In fact, he was accompanied by an elephant in this forest, a bull elephant who'd uh, had some problems with his tribe, his herd. The female elephants jostled him and being jostled by she elephants is no joke. And the, the young, young elephants would, would steal his leaves and all that. So he was fed up. So he went off and the Buddha and this elephant spent some time just looking after each other in solitary meditation. And so it's really important to, for your spiritual maturity to know when it's time to turn inwards, to not engage, to find seclusion and solitude. And it's in seclusion and solitude that the mind can relax and you can find perspective. So when things get really tough, when you find yourself in intractable situations, when you've got your ideals but you've got no idea how to work them out, it's okay just to say, I don't know, turn away and find yourself some solitude and let things settle. And in that settled state, in seclusion, I don't know if you've had this experience, clues can come, the heart can can make its little suggestions in very subtle ways and this is I think uh, how the Buddha operated. He wasn't sort of 100% compassion is what I'm saying. Uh, somebody said to me the other day that there's a sutta in the Pali Canon which uh, makes the point that the Buddha has two thoughts. The thought of compassion and the thought of solitude. Compassion and solitude and this is real mature compassion I think knows when it's time to, uh, to take a break, look after your own uh, ideals. So I'll conclude by talking about the stage in which we radiate uh, love to all beings, we pervade the directions with love. This is the culmination of the practice. It's the, uh, as it were, the, the point of the whole practice is to uh, pervade the whole world with uh, an attitude of metta. And I think uh, what's meant here, what's meant here, apart from an imaginative exercise, is a sort of process of restructuring our emotional relationships entirely. So to start with, you know, this, this kind of idealism, this kind of idealistic spiritual teaching, we might find ourselves sitting down and having some success uh, with it. But then after a bit of, um, after some success, we might find it rather difficult. We might find it almost impossible. We might think, how on earth did anybody do, can anybody do this? How can they uh, imagine all beings everywhere and uh, wish them well? 
we find ourselves just stuck in our uh, in our own uh, emotional stuff as it were but um, of course it's not easy and the point of this stage is as it were to rehearse a kind of restructuring of uh, the way we relate to 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 everything really it's a bit like I, I quite like this metaphor of uh, that you hear in the in the mindfulness movement about uh, restructuring neural pathways have you come across this one by, by continuously doing mindfulness of the body and so on you can undo old patterns of how the brain works make neural pathways new neural pathways and hence find ways out of your um, uh, stress and depression and so on into uh, healthy embodied mindful states I think something similar goes on if you keep practicing metta bhavana um, our emotional relationships get restructured and this is a long-term thing it's uh, not always easy I think what's uh, very striking and this is where it might be disillusioning is that people don't always appreciate it yeah actually some people would really like you just to love them yeah uh, and not everybody people would like you to um, think they're special whereas if you do this kind of metta bhavana practice your concern is for all beings uh, anyway we're all human beings aren't we we're all worthy of, of love loving kindness so somebody who actually really uh, wants love just for them has the kind of narcissism, narcissism which you're starting to uh, get away from uh, is someone who's going to find it very difficult that to your practicing metta bhavana and disillusionment might crop up in a way uh, we're giving up what we want by practicing metta bhavana we're giving up what we want this subtle narcissism of practicing our spiritual ideals in order to make ourselves feel happy going through a process of disillusionment when we find that it doesn't match what we wanted in a subtle way but in order to gain spiritual maturity which is really seeing how things are being able to practice these ideals in such a way that uh, we ourselves have a certain sort of wisdom we ourselves are not naive and we're actually able to um, practice these ideals at least to some extent exactly as the uh, Buddha taught in that sense metta love is an aspect of awakening so aspect of the awakened heart so with all that in mind I wish you well and uh, all the best in whatever goes on for you as you move on from this festival out into the world thank you